All right. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Um, Ang Tui from Red Balloon Security. Uh, I am up here present. Well, so this is a work that we did over the last two years. Uh, lots and lots of people helped out, especially people from you know within Red Balloon Security. And there are two authors to two of the papers that we wrote on on this. And the United States loved both of them so much that they couldn't leave the country for different reasons. So I'm up here presenting on work that you know we all did. A lot of people helped out. And without further ado, all right. So slides. Okay. All right, here we go. Cryo, mechanical, memory, X, traction. All right, so this is a talk on freezing RAM chips uh, with a little robot and then getting it off of a device to read the memory so that we can see you know, what computers are thinking because we almost never know. It's, it's a mystery. Um, and like I said, right, so this is a, man, work, you know, some, like, when I started making the slides, I'm reflecting on all of the last two years of us working on it, and the greatest uh, philosopher of all time once said, I can't see him coming down my eyes because I got to make these slides cry. Yo. <laughs> eh? All right. Uh, Jay-Z, by the way. Yes. Said exactly that. All right. So this is um, ah, a story of a failure, many failures. So. This is a, like a failure of, of seven months of failure inside a longer period of like 18 months of broader failure. Um, and you know, the way these uh, research problems go, uh, we did end with like a tiny drizzle of epic win right at the very end, but this is uh, definitely you know, 18 months of us working through all sorts of shenanigan problems um, and finally getting to this place with the robot that we're, I'm gonna talk about. It's literally outside the door, so you know, you, you definitely should uh, play with it, you know, the physical thing uh, right over there. So what do we do? What do we win? Um, all right, so I guess the first thing that we won is we wrote two papers, or, you know. Um, the first paper over here is about the, uh, about the robot doing cryomechanical memory extraction. And uh, the, the second paper was um, <laughs> basically, you know, what we got out of using this robot on an embedded device. And, and that device happens to be the, um, the Siemens S7-1500 PLC CPU, right? So uh, I definitely recommend you check out the papers. I'm gonna go over a lot of the practical engineering uh, things that we solved for this project, but there are a lot of technical details both on the Siemens thing and also the, the robot in the paper. Okay, so, you know, like whatever, that's a paper. So what do we really win? So, um, you know, over here, right, like in this burgundy color, so that's, the market share of Siemens Industrial Control in North America, and this other bar, I think it's for Europe, and you know, some other for Europe. Yes. So if you average this together, you know, Siemens PLCs probably <laughs> run something like 40% of the global industrial control uh, market, and this was the thing that we found on it. Okay. Um, so. Uh, missing immutable root of trust in the uh, 1500 CPU, and these are the devices that it affects. There's a second page. There's a third page. There's a fourth page. Uh, five and six, seven, <laughs> eight, nine, ten. All right, and this is uh, their mitigation recommendations. Um, and I think that at the time that we disclosed the vulnerability. Um, probably in February of this year, th I, this affected every single 1500 CPU module that Siemens made. And, you know, these things are in the ground for about, you know, seven to 15 years, right? So, which makes this response kind of not the best. So this is uh, their recommendation for workarounds and mitigations, right? And this is, um, you know, industrial control still can get away with this kind of response. They just say like physical access, right? Lock your door. Uh, and, and your CPU will be cool. Um, and then in terms of fixing <laughs> the secure boot vulnerability, they just flat out said like, nope, <laughs> goodbye. No fix, no mitigation, right? Just lock your, your PLC up and everything's fine. So, you know, I think on a meta level, like this was a, a really good technical sort of achievement for the researchers that did this work, but I don't think this is a good response for, you know, like the world, right? Because, uh, you know, we depend on these things. 
a lot of the time. So on a technical level, like what did we really, really win? Um, the game was uh, we stared at this thing and poked at it with stuff until it cried uncle. And if you look at it, <coughs> it doesn't look all that complicated, right? And we're really just talking about this baseboard over here. Um, you know, it's about yay big and, you know, why is this so hard and, you know, what's the big deal? So, like I said, you know, the big deal on it is <coughs> uh, this is the current prime time, you know, th you know, PLC CPU module sort of offering by Siemens and they have, yeah, like 30% of the ICS market globally. So this makes the, the 1500 line of uh, CPUs, PLC CPUs probably, I don't know, like single digit, maybe double digit. Uh, of PLCs like in the ground running critical infrastructure like today, now, today. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, <clears throat> looking at the hardware, right, so, you know, we wanted to, yeah, first, you know, get introspection into the device to see, you know, what it's doing, how it's thinking, how it's feeling. Uh, and uh, what we found was, you know, this looks simple, but um, there's some elegance to the, the hardware obfuscation in the design. So. Um, it's uh, basically, the, there are three big rectangles that just says Siemens, right, goodbye. Like, it's a pretty integrated custom package. Um, and then on top of that, you know, they did a whole lot of what I call product finishing. So it's not necessarily hardware security, but they did go through uh, this process of actually just removing all the debug interfaces. There was nothing that we really found that allowed us to even look at the boot log or no, no JTAG certainly, right, and there was, um, sort of observing like the color of an LED when it turns on or when it crashes, there was uh, basically no way for us to introspect the system, you know, as it's running. And on top of that, they have um, a encrypted bootloader on flash. So every single thing starting from the boot code to the OS to the user space code here was all encrypted. So, you know, like we looked at this simple little thing and we said, okay, like what next, right? So it was actually really difficult to, um, get our foot in the door to do any kind of security analysis. And like I said, you know, this isn't necessarily good for security. It was just good for obfuscation and it wasted a whole lot of our time. And I think in, um, well, then we did the rest of this. So, you know, looking at this board, right, we, um, we can't really see inside. So the typical sort of thought, pro oh. Jeez. Okay. I'm just not gonna move. All right, uh, the typical thought process here, right, is, um, you know, if you can't just JTAG in, what are you gonna do? Well, so we can start doing, you know, like a lot of different fault injections, right? We can like, you know, power it, EMFI, you know, clock glitching and, and all of that. But at the end of the day though, you know, even if we did do something interesting from a glitching perspective, there's still no debug output. We're, we're still looking at that little LED, right? That, that's as much information as we are able, able to see from a crash. Um, <clears throat> the next thing maybe like, okay, we can decap the chip and like, I don't know, question mark, do some really ninja stuff with, with a SAM and a FIB, but I'm embarrassed to say I don't have a SAM or a FIB. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and each of, you know, when, when we're talking about decapping a physical uh, destructive analysis, you know, each of these boards is actually like $1,500 and, you know, that's a lot of money and, you know, it takes weeks for us to get these off of eBay. Um, and uh, all of the custom sock stuff just kind of screamed like really complicated and expensive to us. So, you know, that's a path, but we didn't take that. And then, you know, the next thing we can try is like, okay, we can like try it really, really, really hard to find JTAG and some debugging interface. But, you know, we did try this and this became an infinite loop, right? Because, you know, like it didn't work and we come back and we say, huh, let's try really, 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 really hard. Um, and we just didn't find it. So. And then, yeah, we can shout and say mean things to the board, but this was uh, shockingly ineffective <laughs> scientifically. So, you know, we looked at it and we said, okay, like, you know, we can do all of these things, but, you know, th well, this path is, uh, you know, very custom and, you know, not really repeatable across different types of devices. So, you know, that's a whole lot of effort for this one board. And I wanted to create something that was uh, generic and usable for embedded devices across the board that has this level of, you know, finishing and obfuscation, right? But uh, not encrypted memory. So the idea that we had was, right? So then we said the simplest thing to do must be to build a robot, of course, right? And then uh, read its memory, right? And then read its mind. This from face off, you know, like, like face off. Um, and that was, the, uh, that was the idea. So, 
you know, when I first started talking to people about this idea, um, a lot of uh, what I got was, um, oh yeah, you know, Kobu attacks, right? Like this is super well understood and well documented, there were papers on it, and that is true, and this is, um, I think, a really good paper that, you know, got me started thinking about um, data remnants on dynamic memory. Uh, but, you know, really cool idea in the paper, but, you know, it's from a quantitative analysis, like in scientific process kind of perspective, that this is the image, right? So that is a person's hand with a can of CO2, right, upside down, pointing at his, her, his helpless uh, ThinkPad from, I don't know, like 12 years ago, right? So it's not exactly, you know, all that scientific, but, and it also didn't really apply to this, right? So the first thing that we, you know, after reading the paper and thinking about it, and when we sat down to, to actually do this, um, it was this, like, <laughs> right? <laughs> when come, you have no dim slot, so this thing doesn't have a dim slot, right? You can't just, like, remove the module, all right? So at least uh, we had to solve some mechanical uh, process of getting the memory, you know, cold, like, off of the device and onto something that can read it, and so that was one thing, and then uh, we sat and thought about it for like one more minute, and then like more and more problems started to come out, right? And we're gonna talk about some of those problems. Um, so <laughs> the second problem, aside from the fact that these things don't have a slot and you have to physically you know, desolder the thing, get it back on, off, on again, was that uh, this module, the CPU has um, five memory chips, right? And you know, it's LPDDR1, so that's kind of good because you know, like we don't have to maybe work with like fast timing uh, as much, but you know, it has five chips and also the th it has three chips on the top of the board and two chips on the bottom of the board, right? So, you know, that's not exactly easy and the naive way to, to go about this maybe is to build like Pi May, like five prong of like death, right? And simultaneously pull all the five chips off, but if you think about how <laughs> like hilariously not doable that is on our budget, I mean, we didn't do that. So. And part of the project also, the focus was to do this, but also to build it uh, you know, on, a, on a budget for about $1,000 so we can use this on all of the things um, going forward. So uh, here's the plan, <coughs> right? First we're gonna, you know, we have a, a scrap CNC little engraver thing in the office, so we're gonna first you know, Frankenstein something that can actually move the memory chip from one thing to another, right, and then well, at, at runtime to read the, uh, the RAM chip. And the second thing is, okay, so we have to rip the five RAM chips and reconstruct memory. So the chips are, you know, the, the five chips are uh, striped together and used simultaneously with ECC, right? If you think about, you know, the five chips, like four is probably 32 bits and, and the other one ECC. Um, but we're not gonna be able to do it simultaneously because that's really complicated. So the idea is we somehow rip the memory chip at the same point in execution many times to reconstruct all of the bits from the memory, at least five times. Um, and you know, we're not talking about a gigahertz processor here, but you know, like how do you pull five different chips over and over again reliably at like the same, I don't know, three or four instructions, right? You probably have like a hundred nanosecond timing window, which is um, kind of ridiculous for like a physical piston or a thing to move up and down that reliably. All right, so if we can do that, then number three, like somehow magically combine, right, the, the bits of the memory that we extracted across multiple runs. Um, and then who knows what comes after. And then number five, hopefully at least read the unencrypted boot code or whatever code is executing in memory, right, through the boot process so we can look at it to see, I don't know, what, what's actually inside. Um, we actually did it. So here, uh, so, you know, this talk is gonna focus on the pragmatic aspect of how you go about building this thing. Like I said, the robot is literally outside, so if you're interested in doing this, uh, play with it, um, and I'm gonna show you basically how to build this for about $1,000 with a uh, COTS hardware that anybody can buy. But there are a whole lot more details uh, in the, the wood paper that is um, up there. Okay, so um, let's talk about, so, this took, like I said, seven months of continuous failing and failing and failing. But you know, we're going to fast forward to the solution that we got actually to work. So, you know, basically, what did this involve? We needed to build a sufficiently precise linear actuator, right, uh, on a budget, and then we need to find some kind of a magical like RAM um, socket that allows us to move the thing 
like from device to device. And if you think about the traditional sockets, like it, you, you can have a clip or a clamshell, but building a robot that does that is a little complicated. So maybe find the right socket thing. And then after that, active closed loop cooling for the RAM. And also the reason why we call this you know, a cryomechanical memory extraction and not just co-boot, it's not just we want to be fancy about it, and everybody calls it co-boot, but if you actually have closed loop active uh, cooling, right, you can then start to pull the memory chip off wait, after it boots. So it's not just co-boot, right, which means that the name itself is a little misleading. You can pull this memory chip whenever you want as long as you have active cooling that's sufficient you know, during runtime. So we, we built that active cooling uh, loop and then figure out a way to extract the, the five chips at the same time and the same place in code execution. Uh, so that way we can actually get, you know, assuming that we have a deterministic uh, execution, right? If we can pull the, the chip at the right time, then we can actually have a, a chance of reassembling all the physical memory and then virtual memory and then the, the code and the heap and the stack and all of that. And then um, lastly, we built uh, an FPGA uh, thing to do the actual DDR RAM dumping, right? It speaks to a loosey-goosey version of the DDR state machine. And we did this for DDR, well, LPDDR1 and DDR2 and 3. Um, we did all, all three of those. All right, so we're going to start to hit all of these in, in that order. Um, so first, right, how do you make a precise-ish, like a linear actuation thing on a, on a budget? Um, well, we started with this, right? So I actually have, there's a special place in my heart for, for things like this. Um, this controller, you can just throw away, right? And the motors are okay-ish, but you know what you get for this money, like this is actually like a fairly precise and sturdy little body. So the aluminum extrusion is pretty rigid, and inside it, it has a ball lead screws, which actually allows you to move fairly precisely without losing you know precision and, and movement. But you buy this, and then the next thing you do is you junk like all of these parts, right? Because um, you know. Out of the box, it doesn't actually get you precise movement, but you know we'll get there. So the first thing that I did was, um, you know, thinking about okay, like if anybody has ever done any kind of, like I don't know, CNC or 3D printing, and if you get your height wrong, right, you can imagine just breaking your tool or dragging things around, and you say, oh man, I gotta start over. This sucks. So I mean, I knew that like <laughs> just thinking about how expensive this hardware is and how hard it is to actually like take a stepper motor and put the thing down at the right place with the right force with a stepper motor. Right, the first thing that we did is we took the z-axis off, and we went with a pneumatic pneumatic uh, cylinder actuator. Right, so you know it's exactly what it sounds like. It's pneumatic. It runs on air. It's a cylinder, this you know thing, and uh, it has. I mean, and it's fairly cheap. It's like 20 bucks, but it basically is this airtight piston, right? That you know pressurized air uh, moves the thing up and down. So you know, in order to make this to machine an air piston. You're going to have to have a certain amount, right? First of all, of, um, precision in the machining. Otherwise, it'll leak air and it won't work. But then also, you know, thinking about this, pneumatic means you're, the pressure is being generated by air pressure. So you're literally sitting, you know, on an air cushion when you push the memory chip down. So it has more of a gentle sort of pressure slope, you know, uh, when we actually do the memory pushing and the pulling. So that totally worked out. And then we, you hook it up to um, this little pneumatic solenoid, right? You can get like a thing uh, on a manifold, four of them for like 40 bucks. So this is great, um, and it's super duper affordable. All right, and also what we found is, um, you know, these things are typically meant to run at way higher than, you know, 10 PSI, but <laughs> I'll show you what happens when you push, you know, like a memory chip uh, with air at like 100 PSI, right? It screams and it cries and it dies. So uh, we dialed it in, so anywhere between like 10, seven to like 15 PSI is really the sweet spot. So you need a, a little pressure regulator, but you know we're we're running this thing way lower than standard PSI on it, but it was very gentle in the work. Um, okay, so then the next thing is, all right. So <laughs> when you buy this thing, right, it looks great. It is great uh, for what you're paying for, um, but almost guaranteed every single screw inside this machine is going to have a random value of tightness, right? And and none of the the surfaces and the edges that look like they should be squared and parallel will be. Uh, you know, at this level of precision. So basically, um, you need to, yeah, like get an indicator, dial this thing in, and I'll, I'll show you some uh, videos of that. And, and actually, there are right and wrong ways to turn a screw. This is actually really true. So 
what you need is <laughs> like an infinite supply of uh, like shin stock, right, and patience. And if you are doing this with a friend late at night, no one should talk <laughs> because uh, you know just like everybody knows that, like, the, the right way to like shim a thing. But you know, so lots and lots of patience, right, and shim stock. Um, you know, this took us like two days to really kind of dial the thing in, but you can do it. Once you do it, it'll stay more or less um, pretty close to perfect for what we need. And that's the, the mechanical chassis, right? So when we have that down, let's talk about how to move things, right? So, you know, if, like I said, for people who have, um, you know, like 3D printers, right? Everybody knows what this is. This is a stepper motor, right? Like it steps, it moves, and it's fairly, you know, it's, vastly mass manufactured, so very um, <coughs> accurate for like an $8 thing. Um, but then if you actually, so is this out of the box um, good enough for what we're doing? Probably not, and, and here's the thing, right? Like steppers, how do they move? You know, people say, huh, there's a step, you, you give it a pulse and it steps, but what is a step, right? Like something has to have a mechanical linkage that turns, you know, that takes that into linear motion and uh, a lot of things can go wrong if you have just this with a lead screw. So number one, you can have a bent lead screw, right? Lead screws can be imperfect. Um, and number two, backlash, right? If you look at the, um, the threads of the, the nut and the lead screw, it's never 100% perfect and it actually can't be. So there's gonna be some back and forth give, right? So you know, with that and the stepper motor, how do you actually get you know, precise movement for all sorts of industrial applications? And <laughs> here's the right answer. Just um, you can convert money, right, into a really good hardware. Um, and by that we mean basically, you know, like linear encoders and, and um, uh, resolvers, which are analog. And you put this along the, the axis of movement, and this gives you an active feedback on where the the motor, where the head of the thing actually is at any given time. So you know, this is basically closed loop control, right? So you don't just tell it to move. You also watch exactly where it's going and how far it's deviated from its target. Okay, but that's um, kind of expensive. So there are, uh, like there's a compromise, right? So on the left you have um, this thing called the Technic motor, right? It's made by a company called ClearPath. <clears throat> and basically what it is, it, it's a pretty good um, uh, stepper motor, but it actually has a hard real, like, em embedded processor, um, encoder, and lots of sensors inside and a real-time management firmware that actually gives you closed-loop control just in a single package, right? You're not getting the linear encoder, but this will track very precisely rotational accuracy. Um, but, you know, that's like $300 a pop, right? And then this beautiful thing on the right, it's um, $26, $27. And what it is, it's, um, uh, it, this is based on an open source project. Right, it's a little PCB, so very much similar to, to this thing on the left, but instead of like a really nice optical encoder with high precision, right, uh, this thing uses a halt sensor, so you just super glue a magnet to the back of the rotary shaft, right, and there's a halt sensor underneath this PCB that actually tracks, right, uh, where it's going. So this is um, like a really elegant way of converting, you know, like not great hardware into fairly precise closed loop um, control linear motion on an X and Y axis. And uh, so we actually have videos on both of these. So I'm gonna show you the one on the left. This is uh, the technic motor that we're using on the robot outside. And this is um, uh, an indicator, right? So each tick here is 12.7-ish microns, right? So we're talking fairly small. You know, it's not tiny, tiny, but, uh, and we're gonna basically move the thing back and forth to see how predictable, how reliable and how precise and accurate um, motion control is, you know, with just uh, closed loop control on the rotational motor itself. Um, so let's play. You'll never guess what happens. All right, so it's moving, right, and it touches, it settles there. I'm going to back off, and we do it again. It goes back to exactly the same place. So, you know, like we have, uh, yeah, t like 12 micron sort of uh, per tick you know, indicator. So as far as we can see, like it, this is pretty good. And, um, you know, so this is, uh, yeah, like $600 of motors. Uh, they're great, but um, this is the same. Th oh, um, this is another XY stage that we put together literally like three days ago, uh, running the, um, the $26 closed loop control motor, right? And let's see what happens here. 
and this is actually at zero, so it's moving back. And it goes to exactly the same place. So with both of these, you can give very, very precise movement on standard you know, CNC hardware and a pair of either you know, slightly fancy motors or like a pair of like $30 motors. Um, they both work. So with that, let's see. All right, cool. So that's kind of how we solved the, the, the movement problem. Um, the next thing we had to do was uh, figure out like, if we can move precisely, how are we going to get this memory chip on and off you know, the FPGA and the target device without destroying the device or the memory? And the really cool answer here is um, this thing called silver ball matrix elastomer socket, right? Um, it's super fancy, but this is, uh, you know, we have a few outside you can touch and play with and look at under microscope. But basically this is, I think they 3D printed, I'm not actually sure, but uh, it is silicone substrate with um, columns of, I think probably also silicone substrate with doped uh, small particles of silver or gold or something super conductive. Um, and this is, yeah, like a, a side view, this is the top view, right? So this also has the consistency of like, I don't know, hard gummy bear, basically. So it's really good for compression socket, right? Like perfect for what we need to do. And the specs on these things are kind of ridiculous. So this can do like, you know, 40 gigahertz bandwidth for testing, like per pin. I think it can dissipate like, or, or push through like 10 or maybe a, a lot of power per pin. And also this thing, <laughs> works at minus 55C, which is special because that's basically dry ice territory and also the, uh, the territory of where we need to cool uh, our chip. So, but all of this, right, I don't know if you have bought stuff from Ironwood and, and companies like that. Um, they're really great, they're expensive. But here's the next thing that was kind of a game changer. Okay, so this is uh, Taobao and we were able to buy this many elastomer sockets 40 for this many monies, right? So there are a whole lot of uh, Chinese manufacturers now that actually will do custom runs of these. I think they 3D printed, and this is literally just like glued onto this little metal thing, right, for, for support. But um, it's very affordable now, and like I said, you can actually do super small custom runs of whatever footprint you want. Um, and yeah, they're like, you know, this much, like 30 bucks a, a socket, which is great. And also these sockets last forever, right? So they have, like a test cycle rated for, well, okay, let me, the Ironwood one <laughs> has a test cycle rated for like tens to like 100,000 uh, compression cycles. I, I don't think this one has it, but who cares, right? Like this is, um, I've never actually had a socket fail on us because of wear and tear. Um, so th these are really good and very much affordable. Okay, so that's number two down, right? And then number three, let's talk about active cooling. Um, so, you know, we, we started out with, uh, with using dry ice and instead of active cooling, we literally just, you know, had a dry ice isopropyl alcohol bath, right, in, in this little box where we dumped a memory chip and we cool it down before we actually run just the cold boot process. Um, and uh, that sort of worked, um, but also in the middle of last summer when we were doing this, uh, <laughs> the United States had a dry ice shortage and I started thinking, you know, that kind of sucks, right? And we also can't really store dry ice. Uh, it kind of evaporates over a few days. So we went to, um, I started thinking of liquid nitrogen. And I said, you know what? Like, if there's one group of people who figured out like active liquid nitrogen cooling for like computer stuff, right? It's like PC overclocking people. And so I, I did some research and it was amazing. Um, so this is what they do, right? Like this is the high tech standard. So you take a, a thermos you pour the liquid nitrogen into a bucket on top of the processor, and then you also take a torch to warm the bottom of it because of condensation and stuff, and this is the state of the art of like active liquid nitrogen cooling. I mean, I think Coolant sells this thing. It's like, I don't actually know how much it is, but it looks fancy and high tech, and I couldn't really understand like how to use this until I saw the video, and it's literally just you pour the liquid nitrogen by hand on a thing, right? I, I didn't like that. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not really great. Um, so here's what we did, right? We um, built this closed loop little, uh, basically this is kind of like your typical like water cooling you know, block for CPU or GPU. We machined it, this is, uh, you know, every, like every time I look at it, it looks like a little piggy with, you know, like in a blanket or, or something. But, you know, we machined this, 
Um, and inside, right, we we're pushing through uh, isopropyl alcohol inside the tube, just like water cooling. Um, but, you know, we're freezing this in below zero, so you shouldn't use water, right? It will freeze. Um, so we ended up using isopropyl alcohol, and uh, we have a pump here that moves the liquid through um, a heat exchanger that has a, another IPA bath. And what we do is we just, you know, cool the IPA bath, right? Liquid moves around, heat exchanger, right? Cools the, the head, right? And this is, um, it's got the benefit that this can basically, you can cool the IPA however you want. Um, you can throw literally just dry ice into the IPA bath. You can shoot liquid nitrogen into the bath. However you do it, it basically works, except um, so the vapor point for uh, LN2 liquid nitrogen is like minus 195 Celsius, and the freezing point uh, isopropyl alcohol is like minus 95 degrees Celsius, right? So you're not really gonna have a problem with um, CO2, but if you use LN LN2, um, you're going to basically have to figure out a way how not to, like, have the liquid inside freeze and, and block the, the path of um, the liquid. So we machined this in, in our shop, and the next thing we did is um, I tried a bunch of pumps. So, you know, like, I thought, hey, let's just get a pump and connect it. Like, I had a few impeller pumps, but, you know, I found out, like, very quickly that impeller pumps makes heat, <laughs> right? And it actually, the more powerful the pump, the more heat it makes, makes a lot of sense, because uh, the impeller is literally coming in contact with the liquid you're trying to cool with the, mo with the motor coil and all, right? So um, what we ended up doing is getting a parasolic pump, right? This is the sort of thing that you find in like dialysis machines and, and things like that. It doesn't have nearly the, the same static pressure that it generates, but what is cool about this is it's literally like a, a ro like set of rollers that pushes liquid through a tube, right? So the liquid you, you're trying to cool, in this case, never makes con mechanical contact with the rest of the pump, so it doesn't introduce nearly as much heat. Um, and I bought the biggest parallel pump on McMaster, and that wasn't cheap, but it's a cool thing to have. Um, so that pump is, uh, that works, and here is a video of basically the active cooling thing doing its thing. All right, so the cooler is literally outside, right, the IPA bath, the heat exchanger, and in this case, we're just shooting liquid nitrogen into uh, the IPA bath, and, you know, if you're doing this, like, like I said, <clears throat> making sure that the IPA doesn't freeze is super duper important. And the way to do that is essentially don't put the liquid nitrogen on top of the heat exchanger, right? Because it will go down to minus 195 and then come back up, up again. So you want to slowly lower the temperature of the IPA bath away from the heat exchanger. And if you do that, um, and also like just put um, a heat sensor, a temperature sensor on the head, right? You can actually just put it into a pit loop and slowly decrease the temperature of the IPA bath, and that actually works pretty okay-ish, right? Sometimes you are gonna get things that freeze, but you know, if that happens, you just warm it up, warm it up a little bit and, and start over again. Okay, so that's um, active cooling, all right? We got that down. Now, memory extraction timing, right? So if you think about it, you know, like we have to pull five chips. We can do this one at a time. You know, we have these sockets, and what we actually did is, um, you know, we took one memory module off, put the socket on, and then when we're done with that, we would solder the, the memory back on and do it to the next one and the next one. Um, but, you know, if we had a 100 nanosecond window to do this reliably every time, right, like, you know, this CNC is not gonna be able to do that, not really, right? Like, that's, that's kind of a hard target to, um, to hit. So does anybody have an idea, like, how to do it? I mean, I'm presenting, so I should just tell you, but think about it, right? Um, so here was the, the little aha thing that we had. So we um, started measuring the EM, uh, electromagnetic emanation coming off of the device during boot, and what we were looking for is just periods of CPU-bound execution, right? Like, think about the like, architecture 101, right? You have um, IO-bound, CPU-bound, and if you have CPU-bound operation, guess what it's not doing, right? It's not writing to memory. So instead of, like, you know, a scale of, like, nanoseconds, we have windows of, like, tens of milliseconds where we can actually do the extraction, and this got around basically the requirement for super duper fast timing, like precise timing extraction thing. So we found a bunch of these just by putting a near field probe onto a spectrum analyzer and then running the boot process and analyzing that data, right? So what does CPU bound execution look like, you know, uh, on this thing? Well, um, you're not gonna hear anything much from memory and you're gonna hear stuff 
on the CPU, right? So that's a, literally what, what that is. And um, yeah, we were able to find super wide windows where we can actually do this uh, timing, and that was the thing that allowed us to reliably extract memory and then stitch it back together across five chips. Um, we did like tens of runs, and it, it worked. Okay, so that's four, that's four down. Um, next thing is uh, how do we do, F no, how do we do the actual DDR memory dumping? So we started with um, LP DDR1, um, and for that we actually designed our own PCB, a uh, carrier board that goes onto a zinc, FPGA, and the whole thing, right? Um, this took a lot of time to do, and if you guys have tried to actually like design a PCB with um, DDR memory, right, like impedance matching, all that stuff, was, you know, you have to get that right, and it was kind of a nightmare. Um, but then we started thinking about like DDR2 and 3, and it turns out you can just buy dev boards, right, with FPGAs on it with that memory footprint, right, already there, so, um, Digilent did all the hard work for us, and we literally just put a socket on this thing. Uh, it took like no time at all, and it worked much better. And this is a uh, DDR, so this is one, DDR2, and DDR3 is even better, right? So, you know, like this is even cheaper of a FPGA board. And, um, and yeah, like right now, if you want to do DDR4, you're gonna pay some, you know, like money for, for like a FPGA with that memory socket, but it's, it's very doable, right? And then uh, we just wrote this, you know, it took like two minutes, FPGA is easy, right? Like we didn't have to debug at all, like that's it, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this wasn't terribly complicated. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that, I didn't do this, someone else did. But um, yeah, basically this is a uh, DDR3 memory controller hooked up to the AXI bus, right, running on the zinc board with um, the memory interface thing, right? So uh, that's what we did, and then uh, after that, right, so let's, let's review. Um, you know, we built, did we do a sufficient precise linear motion thing? Yes, we did, right? Could we actually find a cool socket? Yep, they're 30 bucks a pop, elastomer. Um, and then uh, can we do closed loop control, like a closed loop cooling on the RAM chip? Sort of, basically, right? And then uh, memory extraction timing, right? Um, CPU bound operation, like totally works, and then DDR123, RAM dumper, right, like, you know, FPGA, right? We, we did get that to work. So with all of that done, this is what it looks like. And this is actually a video from, from last year, and if you notice, right, this thing didn't have an active cooling system. This was just a, a Cisco phone on the DDR3 uh, FPGA board. Um, but let's see it work. All right, so we, so there's like a little bath area for uh, cold isopropyl alcohol, right, where the dryers doesn't touch, so we're cooling the memory. We dab it on some paper towel for uh, condensation and things. We put it on the Cisco phone, we see it booting up, right, and at the right time, we literally take the memory chip off and we put it on our FPGA, and then we get to read it. Like, cool. And it works, yay, you know. Uh, and then, <laughs> Later on, you know, we added uh, something, like I, I got a case for it, and now it has, you know, like a fairly cool control system, and these are the, um, the pneumatic valves that we have, right, power supplies and all this stuff, temperature sensor, PID loop for real-time control for the temperature and liquid nitrogen valve uh, thing, and, uh, and yeah, so this is um, the state of uh, the robot today, and it is fairly reliable and, and repeatable, so, you know, one cool thing about, you know, doing it this way versus like an interposer, Right, you can basically arrange, you know, the PCB whatever you're work, working on on this grid and just dial it in with with an indicator. Um, it's, it's super duper fuck flexible. All right, so with that, then uh, let's see. Okay, well, all right, these are the videos. Um, oh, right, <laughs> and then there's a happy ending to like the epic win thing, right? Um, on the 17 uh, S717 or 1500, uh, what we found is that all of those devices just did. Um, symmetric decryption for bootloader verification instead of signature. Yeah, like that, that's how all of those things run, and they're using this, uh, CP, uh, this ATEC chip to do that encryption, and what we did is, um, you know, we looked at the bootloader, saw this thing, found the chip, and just uh, took that chip off, used it as, as an oracle to basically encrypt bootable images for um, all of the S7s in the world, so, you know, without the Kobu robot, we would not have actually gotten to see the code to a point where we actually can 
read how it's booting up to find this vulnerability. So yeah, like Cobalt Robot after seven months of failure totally worked out. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Um, it's outside, you should uh, play with it. And, uh, and yeah, so I think questions, comments? Feelings? Oh, yay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, ooh, ooh, okay, this is really good. So the question is, um, you know, can we uh, pull the memory chip off at multiple times of execution. So the naive, straightforward way is uh, no, because as soon as you pull the memory chip off, the device generally crashes because you know it doesn't love having its memory just ripped out. Um, but this is um, we have a really uh, a few really interesting sort of open questions that we're we're experimenting with. So with the active cooling, right? Um, you know, is it possible to just is it possible to put the memory chip back on the device or a different memory chip? Right, because if you can do that, you can actually kind of just DJ like physical memory, right, and have it execute and pause and execute and pause. Um, and I don't know, um, so we're playing with that. But if you look at the DDR state machine, so with DDR memory, right, it's not as comp as simple as just you know like read thing from parallel interface. It actually has a pretty complicated state machine of pre-charging, charging, like writing, idle. Um, but that said, though, right. You can probably, if you know the state of the memory controller in your device, yeah, you can, you can probably predict that and then with your FPGA put the physical memory chip back onto that state. We don't know yet, so that is definitely like a thing that we're experimenting with now that we have you know, active cooling on this thing. And then um, a second point that we're looking at, and this is kind of a cool thing to think about, right? So we, we know that memory has maximum frequency that it can operate at because, you know, like computers, heat, all that stuff. Um, but does it have a minimum frequency, right? And the answer is like, yes, like that's not the prof profound part. Like it does have a minimum, but what is that minimum? And can we extend that lower, right? If we cool the thing super duper great, because um, you know, if we can do that, we can use slower hardware to do the reading, right? Instead of like a two gigahertz uh, memory interface on an FPGA, which is like very expensive and not doable. If we can push that down to like, I don't know, like single megahertz, Right, we can like a lot more hardware is in play for building the memory dumper. So, good question. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, this won't work for encrypted memory, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, it it might if you can somehow get the key right for the ephemeral memory. Um, but yeah, like this is um, this is basically, well, I mean that's probably much more complicated. But yeah, the short answer is if you have ephemeral key negotiation and memory encryption on the hardware, right, you're gonna pull out encrypted memory, which you probably won't be able to decrypt, so it won't work. Oh, there, there. Hi, um, can you comment comment on the process of rebuilding, going from these five images, from these five modules, to rebuilding the actual oh, yeah. RAM. Okay, all right, cool. Um, uh, so yeah, I have a few minutes. Okay, okay, so if for, for the details on that, uh, read the paper. But um, so yes, we pulled the five memory uh, chips off. We were pretty sure we had the right timing. Um, and then we tried to put the thing together and we tried every permutation, right? knowing that there's probably ECC, and none of them worked, right? Like, was not any, like, it didn't decode to um, any code ISA that we, we can, we can uh, decode, and no strings of any kind, um, because the actual bits are shuffled, right, across all of the five memory chips, and not just, like, one byte uh, after another byte after another byte, um, because, uh, you know, it's not a security feature, it was just, I think, easy for routing on the PCB. Um, but then we did en um, <coughs> entropy analysis on the bits we got, and it is code and data, so the, the low entropy sort of content. Um, and then we did like two weeks of things, trying blah, 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 and then um, eventually, you know, we had this insight that, you know, maybe there's probably a AES constant somewhere in this memory, right, and we actually did 
some stati statistical analysis to figure out like what the most likely permutation of the bits are. And like long story short, we actually got that to work. Um, and we were able to get the actual bit ordering across the five chips and figure out the ECC algorithm, right, uh, on the, the fifth, well, on the fifth chip. But statistical analysis and a lot of like trying things out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, it's the same chip, it's the same chip. Uh, same key, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not the right way to do it, um, and uh, that's what we found. So yeah, the idea is, um, in reality, you can buy any S7 1500, right, take the ATX chip out, and use that to encrypt more memory, and if it decrypts, it boots, right? So that's not a signature verification. And that's part of the problem, right? How did you actually remove the chip without damaging it if you're having to keep it cold at the same time? Ah, um, well, so removing the physical chip wasn't terribly difficult. Uh, we just, you saw hot air reflow, right? Took that off, cleaned the bottom, reballed it. And actually last year we ran a reballing uh, workshop for that reason. Um, and then the chip is actually just super glued on top, uh, onto the, the, the piston brass uh, block. Um, and if you, there are definitely, tricks to lining that up right. So if you're interested, we can show you outside with the actual robot. Over there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll do that on Sunday maybe, you know, like. Uh, yeah, we, we can do that on Sunday. It'll break. Ooh, and also, uh, it just so happens, um, I always get this wrong, the Xbox S, uses the exact same memory um, footprint as the Cisco phone, and I have two Xboxes with the sockets on it. So if we have some time, we should uh, probably pull the memory off on the bootloader. Um, yeah. But for that, there's 16 memory modules, so patience. <coughs> Anything else? Okay, all right, I think that's, uh, that's it. Um, cool, thanks.